Uh, thanks to Wendell for putting all of this together and, and really being the standard bearer for what, what uh, we do to some extent uh, and our movement system and our teaching system and, and what he's brought to you know, the senior s skiing uh, organizations and, and groups. Uh, also, I, there, I have a lot of friends here and, and I've been to Canada for many years. Last year was my first year at Whistler in almost let, let's say 35 years. Okay, we almost it. 35 years, and, and ran into some really great old friends, and and they're still still here and enjoying skiing. And it's a real thrill for me to come back. Uh, I, you know, my first experience at Whistler was with the national team training here in the summertime. So it goes back to these little you know lifts on the on the what used to be the Whistler Glacier, um, and that's when training here started. And then of course. The races were here, and then you know the nationals are here, and then obviously you all know about the Olympics, so I don't need, don't need to go there. So it's a great history uh, for this area and and how it's grown. So EMTS is the name of the the program we teach, but we are a company called Harp Ski Systems. We happen to use PMTS as our teaching system, um, and we are in Colorado. We're based there. Uh, and we offer many different things in the ski industry. We, we have a rental facility, uh, I mean a, a retail ski sales facility and where we do boot fitting, alignment, the same thing we did with the uh, instructors uh, that came out today and the ski shop people. Uh, we've kind of evolved it um, from the standard approach to alignment where you stand on a stand and they kind of like look at your knees and then they kind of figure out what angles you are, are and, and you're standing on two feet. and that was the beginning of alignment, and and you know it, it had some really good properties and results, but also it had some very kind of dubious results as well. And the reason for that is that when you're standing on two feet doing alignment, there's no dynamics involved. You're just standing there upright. And as we know, when we ski, we put pressure on the side of the boots, and then the skis go through a curve, and there's even more pressure building and and forces coming towards us. So and that's very different from just standing upright on a stand. So we we have done over 5,000 alignments in, in over the years that we have uh, been doing uh, ski shop work and boot sales and boot fitting. And we've documented everyone who's gone through this. Uh, I think that it's the biggest uh, database for alignment in the world. I don't think anybody has even come close to those kinds of numbers that have been recorded. And we also have skied with over 80% of the people that we do alignment with. This is a huge difference from just measuring indoors because you can validate what you're doing on the snow. It's very hard to validate it indoors. Even though you think that your lines are right on the boots and everything is perfect and the foot bed fits and it's comfortable, but the bottom line is it's going to make you ski better. And with different anomalies that people have of curves in their legs or the range of motion of their feet or so on and so forth without getting into much detail with that, uh, it can change when they get out of snow. So what we've done is we've, we've, we've added a dynamic part to the indoor assessment, and which means it balancing. And we also have a, what we call a slant board. And the slant board you stand on, and you have to balance by tipping your feet on the slant board so that you get a s very close to s a simulation of what you're doing when you're skiing. So it gives us more feedback as to what's going to happen when you ski. And then, of course, we tra uh, you know, transpose some of what we see from the skiers after we align them on snow back into the shop. So we have a very kind of narrowed down focus as to what works and what doesn't. So that's the alignment part that we do. And we've evolved it to, as you can see, dynamic align alignment optimization. And, and that's what we call it. But we're trying to get as close as to a skiing simulation indoors as we can. Uh, we, many of you know we produce books and videos, and they've been doing very well, uh, skiers around the world. Uh, we have our clients, skiers, uh, campers come from all over the world. I mean, now it's the even countries in the East Bloc are coming to our camps in Austria and, and, and the United States. So we've got Australians and there's people from New Zealand. Uh, I think the furthest, Thailand, did we have Thailand? or? It's Singapore. Singapore. Okay. Closer. No, they, I didn't, they don't ski in either place. So it doesn't matter. Okay. So uh, we have camps for all levels of skiers. Uh, and we do accreditation and training for ski schools and ski instructors. 
uh, alignment training for ski shop personnel and coaches. And uh, our customers and the people we train, you know, go from racers, junior racers, recreational skiers, all the way to world world class, world cup athletes. So we 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 don't just focus on one area, and this helps us because we see movement development. We see the future of skiing when we work with the World Cup athlete. Um, we've done boots for people who've won medals in the World Championships. Uh, so, and we've maintained that boot, uh, you know, over the years when they change boots. You know, the racers often change boots every year. Uh, so, uh, they come back and, and get that done. So, the, so we have uh, experience at, at the very high ends of the range of skiers and even the intro, in, intro skiers to, to the sport. So. And we use this teaching system here called PMTS Direct Parallel, which doesn't have the snowplow and, and so on that goes with it. So this is just recently, this is a, a week ago, and we were training you know, uh, some coaches uh, at A Basin, and we this year have power, so that's all cool. This is uh, Austria. We have two camps in Austria. Uh, and what does that teaching system do for us as a company? The, the PMTS Direct Parallel Teaching System does, it develops loyal, <coughs> motivated skiers. Uh, this is one thing that we discovered early on. Once you start doing PMTS, you, you, you see the benefits of it, you start getting involved with it, you start seeing how it transfers into streamlining your movements, making it easier to move on snow, so you get kind of hooked uh, to the way of skiing. Uh, our return rate in our camps is very high, as you can see the numbers there. That's kind of an estimation. It could be a little higher. It's not lower. But, but what, what happened with that was it was it became an issue because our followers signed up for the camps early up so that new people couldn't come in. And that was that's good in one way, but it doesn't bring new people into the system. So what we did was we invented a new camp format where Diana and I teach um, what we call the intense camps. And you have to have been to a previous camp, and you have to have been gone through the alignment. So we get all of that out of the way, and then we can really bear down and focus on your, your movements exactly through high levels of refinement. So, and what that does is opens up spots for our other camps, and now new people can come in, and now we've generated a whole new clientele coming in through our system. So that's part of what we've done with, with the uh, camp formats. And if you see our website, you'll see that there are a list of all the camps on there and, and the new formats are on there. Also. As I was saying before, you know, people travel, we're astounded by how far people travel. Europeans come over. Uh, we had five Italians at our last camp, just last week. Uh, uh, someone from Hungary was there. Uh, you know, just, it's just very rewarding for us to see people from Europe coming to ski here for a ski teaching system, uh, and, and not necessarily the, the resorts or the amenities. So we book them very early, our camps book up early, um, and that's what that teaching system does once you get involved with it. Uh, they people study our books. I was skiing down the hill today, I mean, this happened three times today at Whistler. People came up to me and asked me if, if I was involved with the HARPS system. This is like people out of the blue. I've never met them before. They, when we stopped, they would come up and ask me. Uh, or, and uh, and some of our group was there, and they said, "Is this hard, hard thing?" And I mean, this is overwhelming. I mean, you know, I, I don't ski here. People, I don't know how they recognized us. Um, one guy says, "Well, we could tell by the way you ski." Well, that's <laughs> wonderful. I mean, so they must have seen the video. They must have seen the books or, or something to make that connection. And that's astounding when you think about it. For a, for a kind of a recreational skier to see the difference, that makes a huge point. Uh, and most recreational skiers can't tell the difference between you know one instructor or another, you know, or, or or a racer skiing down maybe because they ski faster. But the technique part was very apparent. Um, we love to ski with our skiers. This is the job of a lifetime. I mean. We, we have people who really want to learn how to ski. They're highly motivated. They they enjoy what they're doing. They have bring amazing enthusiasm to it, and we get paid to do this. And what a deal! I mean, this is incredible. So it's probably the funnest job I can think of. I mean, I grew up skiing, so it was part of my life. But this is such an amazing reward. So we're very thankful for that. Um, 
So what does it do for our customers? We just talked about what it does for our company, but we are, we, the system doesn't reverse any movements. You, have to, you don't have to unlearn anything if you start in PMTS. Yes. So if you, if, if you learn the beginning movements, you build on them. They, you grow with the movement. So you don't unlearn a move, maneuver that you learn two or three steps and then you go, oh no, now I've got to turn this around and do it the other way. This is, slows you down, uh, it, and because of this, which is, you know, the, the traditional way is snowplow, snowplow turn, this is the old terminology. Some of you younger folks in here might think of it as a wedge, wedge turn, wedge Christie type thing. And that puts you into a kind of a movement pool that's very hard to break. So we're very <coughs> thankful for ski schools around the world because they have made unlimited <coughs> customers available for our system to teach. So they're generating customers for us every day. And so we're really thankful for the wedge, the wedge turn, and the wedge Christie, because people, you know what, they don't really like it. They'd rather ski parallel, and they'd rather ski more easily with parallel. So we have an endless supply of people out there that we can teach skiing to. And Wendell has seen that happening here, and uh, he's very happy to uh, carry it on here at Whistler. It, in every one of our groups, even if you're in a group of six, and that's our max size for, for our particular camps, we teach to the individual's movement needs. We don't teach a system. So we're teaching movements and we're watching the movements of the student and we're working with the students on their movements. Okay, so if you're in a group, I'm working with your movements, I'm working with Joe's movements, I'm working with Sam's movements, they're getting a private lesson in a group format because I'm addressing their movements, not a system I'm trying to perpetuate on them. That's a very different approach in ski teaching. So this is the result, and people tell us that all the time. I felt like I got a private lesson. This is great. You know, you address my personal movement needs and what what uh, was able to change them. So. Ongoing improvement, clear path, uh, immediate results. Those are some of the things that our customers tell us. Uh, we, after every camp, they have an evaluation form. We get feedback. We process the feedback. We make changes based on the feedback that we get from our customers. We want our customers to tell us what they like. That's what it's about. It's not about us. It's not about our system. It's what our customer, our client, our skier, our campers are experiencing through, this, through our camp formats. The confidence part and the, the, the re reliability for them on their movements to go down in a safe manner with speed control, that's a big part of what they tell us. I feel more comfortable skiing, but I also have better control because we teach them more about, when you see the movements, we teach more of a rounded control turn. So you're never really addressing the fall line and picking up speed, um, undue, undue speed that, that you don't know how to handle. Okay, so that's part of how the system develops. Some of our core principles, high level skiing, and uh, as I said, it's the same movements going all the way through the system, so you're building on movements, so you're headed towards the, the way the best skiers in the world ski, and the best skier in the world to us are ski racers, and we're constantly studying ski racing, and uh, my background is ski coaching, so I, I, I just continue on that path, because you can see the future of skiing and the way it's evolving through the people that are on the cutting edge, and that's what the best ski racers in the world are doing. Uh, they're, they're pushing the limits as far as the movements, movement capabilities and how you move on snow and on skis. So that's what, where we re-engineer those movements and we make them accessible and attainable by regular skiers. And the only difference is speed that they use, uh, the forces they build. So if you detune the speed and you detune the forces, the movements are all there. You can make those movements that a World Cup skier is making. They're not that difficult when you bring them to within the realm of, of learning. And then we have all of the, the exercises that are built into actually accessing those movements. They're all within the PMTS system. So that that's where our that's where our system derives from. It derived from the World Cup skier. We just re-engineered re it down to the level where you anyone could access that kind of movement. One technique 
set of movements for all conditions. That's that's a beautiful thing. If I want to go ski powder tomorrow, if it's going to snow overnight, or I want to ski the bump field, or, or I, I want to ski karate because it's been skied out already, I don't need a different technique. I ski the same exact movements on the groomers as I do in all those situations. So it get, because it's uncomplicated, it makes it simple for you to access all these things that people talk about, all oh, the fun stuff is off-piste. You can ski off-piste with the same movements you're learning on-piste. So you, you don't have to change your technique for skiing bumps. You don't have to change your technique for skiing powder. It's the same technique. And that's really what connects it all, and so that you can feel confidence in getting out of the regular uh, traffic that you see funneling down the hill. Um, Efficiency, which means using less muscle, using more skeletal uh, alignment with your body over the ski, and that has to do somewhat with the alignment uh, of the boots uh, that we talked about a little earlier from the shops. And so that is part of the process. When our campers come to our camps, they go through the alignment process. The coaches watch them on snow to see if, if the, the, the leg shafts are going together. And that's really important to watch because if they're not, you're making adaptive movements, and when you're making adaptive movements, your brain is engaged in a different thing than learning movements. So it's very hard to learn if you've got an alignment issue. So we address that as well as the, uh, the correct movements. The, the basis of PMTS is starting at the bottom in your ski boots with your feet, using your feet and your ankles to tip your boots. That's the key to efficient skiing because and PMTS stands for Primary Movements Teaching System. Primary movements means it's the first in the order of movement. That's what it is. It's the first movement you start with. Okay, and that is, in our case, it's tipping your foot to the little toe edge side, and then the other ski and the other leg follows that. Your legs will follow that. And through the get kinetic chain and the balancing over those movements, your body adapts to balancing, and then the coaches help you. If if it's not natural for you, or if you need more enhancement, or you need to exaggerate a counterbalancing or a balancing movement, the coaches are there to help you to get that. So that's how the system works from the bottom up. Rather than using bigger muscles that disturb balance, where you have to rebalance all the time, we don't teach anything that puts you out of balance. That's one of the key elements of the PMTS teaching system. Okay, so we have the five building blocks of PMTS, which are the essentials of skiing, and they're all listed down here. Tipping, flexing, counterbalancing, counteracting, or uh, control. Now, we will go through these uh, uh, one by one, but uh, they're, they're taught right from the beginning, just as, uh, as parallel skiing is taught right from the beginning with this system. And uh, the top level skiers in the world all use every one of these components. Uh, some of them don't, <laughs> unfortunately. Even on the World Cup, you can see there's a big difference between four skiers right now in slalom. And I use slalom more, more than speed events because we, we, when we ski down the hill, we're looking for control. We have a lot of traffic. We're in, we're in the public arena. If we, if we try to ski GS or, or Super G down a hill, it doesn't work very well. Um, and it, it, it might be dangerous even, and, and there's, there's issues with that. So we teach uh, not only for those reasons of safety and being able to use part, only part of the slope, but the short term is what will get you control and power. It'll get you through the bumps. It'll get you uh, in the steeps, you'll have control. So it's more versatile and it gives you control and confidence in skiing more difficult, difficult terrain. So. Even on the World Cup, there are four people right now on the World Cup in slalom that are distinctly ahead of the rest of the group. There's a big division between the top four, and if you go through the results in the last year or two, you will see there are the same four names mostly appear. And then there's a stack that goes from about fifth place down to 11th or 12th, and they're very close together, within tens of seconds of each other. And the other guys are bigger, have bigger margins and separate themselves. Why? Because the top four guys have this figured out, counterbalance. They have counteracting figured out. Most of them have, most of the top 20 have flexing and they have tipping. Maybe not so much for a balance. In other words, they may get forward to some extent on the ski, but they don't get as forward as the top four guys do. So they're starting the new turn further back on the front of the ski, 
which means that the ski is going to go straighter sooner as soon as you pressure it because it has less shape. You know, when you look at a shaped ski that, that slalom or short turn skis are made with, they're wider at the tip. If you don't put pressure there, your braking mechanism and your sharper turning mechanism isn't deployed. So if you get at the right point on the ski, the ski is going to make the turn for you and it's actually your braking system. It actually slows you down when you put pressure on the tip because it's digging in more, creating more friction, therefore it's bending more, it's making a sharper turn, so you have two forms of speed control right there if you're using the right movements. So, we'll move on to... Uh, these are the uh, foundation of the system is balance. Balance is everything in skiing. In PMTS, balance is maintained, improved, and consistently developed. In other systems, there's balance recovery that happens with a lot of movements. And we don't want to create a situation where you're having to recover balance with the movements you're learning. And so it's designed on purpose to create balance, enhance balance, maintain balance. These are the uh, essentials. Tipping is lower body, feet going back and forth, boots going back and forth. Without your body, upper body leaning in the same direction. So that's why it's called upper body support, and that is counter tipping and counteracting. Those are, if you're tipping one way with your with your feet, and you go the same way with your upper body, the likelihood of you landing on the inside ski and getting out of balance is pretty quick. So we get what we call counter tipping with the upper body so that you can maintain balance at the top of the turn. And the alignment evaluation is critical to this, and we'll talk about how you get poor aft control. But here, this is bump skiing, this is crud skiing or bump skiing also, and this is powder skiing. Exactly the same movements being used for every one of these kinds of conditions. <coughs> so what is the instructor's job in all this? What, are you, what do you expect from instructors teaching skiing? Okay. The first thing is to evaluate the skier. Okay, movement analysis, right? Evaluate. Give you some kind of feedback to the skier as to what they're doing. And, the plan, and that includes what body part you move, what is the action plan to help that body part move better, and what kind of an external cue are you going to give the student so that they can maintain the correct movements while they're skiing on their own. And the external cue is very key to all of this because it's something you can always go to to make sure that you're learning properly and that you're retaining what you learned. And the beauty of this is you don't go away from one of these sessions thinking, what did I just learn? No, you have a plan built in and that is the instructor's job to give you the plan that you can go away with so you can coach yourself as you're skiing. That's a big part of what PMTS does. And we've seen the results of that because when people come back after a year of not coming to camps, almost always they're skiing better than when they, when they left because they're using the same movements and they're improving as they use the movements. Okay, so first is the instructor's job is recognition. So here's an example. Uh, the inside ski is flat. Okay, the skier's inside ski is flat. So the first thing to do is conveying that recognition to the student. Your inside ski is flat. Okay, what? Okay, so what if the lessons stop right there? Well, the student knows they're doing something that the instructor didn't like that much, but what can they do about it? Right? Not much. They, they, nobody gave them a plan yet. So let's go to the next step. Conveying a more desirable alternative, okay? It's better if both skis are at the same angle. Okay, so that, that kind of gives you some insight into it as to what, what you're trying to accomplish, right? Okay, but does it give you anything more than that? Not really. It doesn't give you a plan of action. So if, if let's say, lessons stop there. I mean, yes, there's some benefits to knowing that and some benefits to that information, but it doesn't give you the whole picture yet. You're not going anywhere with it. You may be... Um, astute enough to figure it out on your own, if you've read the books, but uh, it's kind of not really a plan to practice with. You know, you have to go and do it yourself. Okay, so let's talk about the next level of instruction. Conveying which body part to move and how to move it for the desired result. Now, now we're talking. Now we're getting into the meat 
of teaching, right? Okay, the reason you have a flat inside ski is because you stop tipping it throughout the turn. Ah, okay, and how do I do that? Well, well, there's an external cue. How do we deal with the external cue? Well, how do we, how can we convey the external cue that you can work on? Okay, so when I look down at my skis and I want to make a turn to the right, what if I was going to say that I have to tip that ski far enough so that the little toe edge of my whole ski is in the snow? What if I say that the bottom of my foot is pointed toward the other ski boot? Even more, even more uh, obvious is, what if you lighten that ski and touch the edge of the ski on the other boot? The edge, not just the boot. That, there's only one way to do that, and that is having the ski tipped far enough so that it is on edge. It's no longer flat. So now, you convey that movement, you practice it standing there, you practice it stationary, you get a good sense from what you're doing, and then you start to practice it moving. Now the whole loop is, is the whole circle is completed. Now you know what the movement is, you have an external cue, you have the, the, the way to move it, and now you're, you're on your way. The action is tipping, the body part is the inside foot, and you want to keep both skis at the same angle, there you go. Now, I was just talking about the work of skiers a little, a little while ago. That's exactly what they do. We can all do that. They do that to release the ski. They do that to engage the inside foot. Everything right now that's going on on the World Cup is about the inside of your body. Everything that we teach is about the inside of your body in a turn. So if I'm turning to the left, for instance, I'm going this way, I'm preparing the inside foot, I'm flexing the inside leg. When I flex the inside leg, the weight comes off that ski, my body can start to drop to the inside. I relax my hip, my, drop, my, my body drops even further. I feel the grip on the outside ski as I come closer to the fall line. Now you can get more confidence, I drop even in further. There you go. That's a World Cup turn right there. That's how these guys are doing it. But they're doing it very fast with a lot of flexion and more than flexion. The World Cup skiers are doing the retraction. So they're not just flexing the leg. They're actually trying to pull it off the ground so fast that they can flip over onto the new edges without using their muscular effort. They're using gravity and they're using the forces of the mountain. And that's what, that's what PMTS is all about. It's about relaxation, relaxing the body, relaxing your legs, letting your legs move and your feet move, and then relaxing into developing angles. Skiing should be a relaxing sport. Skiing should be about loosening up your lower body, letting your lower body move. And how many skiers do you see out there that get rigid as soon as they start skiing down the hill? And that's because of the foundation of their movement patterns. So this is a very different approach from that standpoint as well. Every movement that you teach should support and increase your balance, not diminish your balance and have to recover balance. Transferring balance from one foot to the other is part of transitions, okay, and it's part of learning uh, the beginnings of a direct parallel system. Where in skiing do we make the biggest body change? The biggest changes in your body come from when you're going from one edge to the other edge. All right? And it so happens that when you're finishing a turn and you're changing your body from one side to the other, guess which way your body's moving? Downhill. How many people are really confident to throw their bodies downhill? Not many. That's, the, that's not a very reassuring thing for me either. But if you know the correct techniques and you release that gripping ski, and you counterbalance or counter tip with the upper body, you will have an instance where you're in balance still as your body's crossing over, and by the time the skis get close to the fall line, you'll have enough centripetal force and momentum to hold yourself up. And that is the moment of faith. You know, everyone says, well, there's a moment of trust in there that I'm not sure I want to go to. Well, if your upper body's going downhill, and you're putting your weight on your inside foot, that trust is not going to be there, I guarantee you. Unless you're going 45 miles an hour in slalom, there's not enough centripetal force to hold you up. Now, the World Cup skiers can get away with that for a little bit, but then they have to come back to counterbalance as they build the bigger angles through the bottom part of the turn. The ones that are staying leaned in, they're not usually in the top 10. I can guarantee you that. And I've got plenty of slides to show you that, 
Uh, and I'll tell you how to find them in, on my blog on, on the internet. You can find them there if you're interested in that kind of scheme. There's a big difference between balancing and stability. Okay, This is where a lot of uh, controversy, you might say, or, or, or explain, explaining can be done. This chair is stable. Right. If your skis are wide and you're standing on both feet, you are stable. But you're not in balance. You're not balancing. You're not. You're not putting your body in a balancing situation. So when your skis are wide and you're on both feet, it's very difficult to create angles with your lower body. So you have to start tossing your upper body around to get it done. And when you toss your upper body around, guess what? You have to push against the ground with your legs. And when you push against the ground with your legs, you're moving your center of mass, which is somewhere around your belly button. And when you start pushing your center of mass around, you're pushing yourself out of balance. So if you're learning how to balance from the beginning and maintaining balance over your skis, you don't have to push your body around. You're centering your, your, you're centering your center of mass in line with your skeleton over your big toe edge, which is the gripping ski. And you're moving with the inside part of your body. And that's the beauty of it. You develop the angles and the edge on the outside, which is your supportive balancing side, but you're moving with the other side of your body, so it's not interfering with balance, and you're not having to push yourself into turrets, you're not having to push yourself to angles. And pushing against the ground is a disturbing type of skiing, and where you're always trying to re-catch yourself. Now, this is an example here. Are you still extending while others are relaxing? Okay, an extension is pretty obvious here. You have a skier with bent legs, and also all of a sudden that skier is standing straight up almost. Okay. Now, when you do that, you can disconnect yourself from the ground, and through this phase of the turn, as you're extending, you cannot move your legs to the side there because the, the action of extension puts pressure on the ground. When push, when you put pressure on the ground, you can't do this. When we talk about a World Cup skier changing edges, they retract their legs. They pull them away from the ground. They flex or bend their legs. What does that do? It lightens your skis on the surface. The momentum from your turn helps you get to the other side. And you can move your legs freely because there's no weight on them. This skier cannot do that. The skier is pinned to the ground with his extension. What does that do? It lengthens your transitions. Transitions are from here to here. And can you make sure it turns with long transitions? No, you need more slope. You've got to go across the slope more. And so you're not getting the, the rhythm, the energy from your turn to help you get into the other turn, or the next turn. So here's a typical scenario here of a skier who's extended and has to push on this leg to get his body across so he can get new angles for the next turn. This is also a wedge, by the way. And this is a high-level demonstrating ski instructor. So when that is taught and part of your system, even the people demonstrating it will show you a wedge in transition in many cases. So it's not a pure parallel term. And it's not used one using energy, it's one using muscular effort. We don't want to use muscular effort when we ski, if we don't have to. Why, why do we want to get more tired going down the hill? No, you have to give up sooner. You don't get as many runs on a powder day, so on and so forth. Okay, this is a, what is different about PMTS? Okay, bent, bent legs, bent legs all the way until new angles appear. The center mass does not go up, and you can get early angles with bent legs. Very different approach from what we saw on the other slides. All right, and transition is very short, and you can make sure it turns. This is an exaggerated example to show big angles. But it, the essence of it is the bending of the legs to create new angles without having to push yourself into the turn or create pressure or use extension movements. OK, so what is the focus on the feet and what's different about this system? Well, the first thing that you learn is that you can tip your lower body without moving your upper body. If I had a, a frame right with ski poles or parallel lines on each side of the body, you can see that there's not much body movement, but the angles are created with the lower body. And here, you can see that the, the hands and the gloves are showing the angles of the feet. And so you're learning 
tipping, and you can do that in a stationary situation, and then you can do it in a traversing situation, and then you can do it in a releasing situation, so that you can bring about the understanding and the feeling of those actions. We talked, I talked about earlier about the feet, or, and the ankles that are really important inside the ski boots to make this happen. Well, right here, on this slide right here, the, the ankle pushes against the side of the boot, and the arch is being lifted in the boot to create the angle of the ski. So skiing, in essence, is inside, is happening inside your ski boots. So you have to kind of put your brain inside your ski boots where your feet are to feel and to make those activities happen. You have to, you have to wake your feet up. So many skiers are out there without any understanding of what's going on or should be going on in your ski boots. And that's where skiing really should happen. It should be happening from inside your ski boots. But you have to learn how those movements are created. And that is the foundation of the PMTS system, and that's why we use it. So here's one of uh, our skiers. Uh, this skier is an accountant. He skis weekends. Not a, he's not a professional skier. Uh, and he showed up doing this over here. Uh, that's called basically leaning or banking. And he ended up skiing like this. And you can see the lines drawn on there. This is more <laughs> vertical. And there's an angle here with his legs. The hand position is totally different. The shoulder, which way is his zipper on his jacket facing relative to that side? You know, the zipper on his jacket is facing his ski tips. It's one straight line. We can all see that. And the angles of his skis are there, but he's also uh, not going to be able to release his legs from there because he's wound up without any upper and lower body uh, separate. We call it separation, but it's really a twist from the upper body and lower body. This, the whole body is going like to the side like this, and his, everything is rotating in the same direction. His upper body and his, his legs are all, and his skis are all going in this direction. Whereas here, the, the indication from the shoulders and the hands, the upper body is actually turning in this direction while the lower body is creating angles, which is a beautiful thing because if your lower body is going this way, in this case, his lower body is going that way, turning to the left. His upper body is trying to maintain or turn to the right. What that does is it creates tension in your mid-body. So the only reason you're able to create that tension is because the skis are on edge. If your skis are sliding, you can't do that. Because you need a resistance at the base to be able to turn your body the other way. Kind of like, you know, a cat that falls off a roof. You know, that cat cannot rotate its front and its back at the same time. It has to create one side against the other to turn itself to land on its feet. It's the same principle here. And when the only reason he's able, he, the skier is able to do that is because his skis are on edge. So he's a base from which to work to counteract his upper body from the rotational forces that are created by the ski and the legs. The beauty of it is this is stored energy. You're getting it for free. You're getting it because you're doing the right movements. And when you do that, and then when the ski is flat, and guess what? And you hold your body the way it is right there. What do the skis do when you flatten them? they automatically start you into the new term for free. You didn't have to do it. They ha it happened by the body naturally unwinding from what you did with the upper body. And that's the beauty of skiing in re with relaxation. And, and, and guess what? If you want to ski powder without effort, you've got to have that. Otherwise, you're chucking yourself all over the place, getting out of balance, throwing body around, getting tired, standing up, doing all these things. You know, how many people try to stand up in powder? What happens when you stand up in powder? You put pressure on your skis, and your skis go deeper into the powder. It's harder to turn. What if you flex in powder, right? Like I was talking about the World Cup skiers, they retract their legs to get in light so they can tip the other side. If you do that in powder, what happens? Your skis come to the top of the powder. Guess what happens when your skis come to the top of the powder? They tip. And then they can go back down into the powder to make the curve. So you're not working hard in powder, and you have total control over your arcs. You make round arcs. You're not spinning your skis heading for the fall line so they run away from you all the time. So that's what we're talking about when it comes to upper body. So we're talking about the counteracting and counterbalancing part of skiing right there. This happens to be the best skier in the world at the moment. Uh, won the World Cup. Won, tied two other skiers in the history of skiing uh, for eight podiums in a season last year. Um, so. Narrow stance, okay, there's some controversy. How many people ski in a wide stance in a pub? No. Well, that doesn't work. 
because one ski might go in the other direction as the other, because they're hard to keep at the same angles when they're wide apart. So most powder skiers who are very efficient, powder rate competitions and all these guys, their feet are closer together. So they create one platform like snowboard. It makes a lot more sense, you get more flotation, right? If they're apart and they're not at the same angles, one ski's gonna go one way and one ski's gonna go the other way. Why do skis cross? Why do people have this trepidation about skis crossing in powder? Well, because they're not starting with tipping the lower ski first and then letting the other one come on second. Most skiers who have trouble in powder are trying to turn the uphill ski into the fall line. And guess what happens? The, the tips go like this. And then they go head over heels, right? Or what's the other thing that happens with powder? You see it all the time. They start a turn, the upper part it starts rotating, it over rotates, the skis start heading uphill, and you go over the, the, the handlebar sideways. So these are all things you see in powder, and they're easy to explain. You're, you can see why these things happen. Okay, this skier, okay, his skis look like they're apart here, right? Okay, this is the fallacy of ski, understanding of ski mechanics. If I put this skier upright, okay, if I took him and put him like this, how far would his feet be apart? They'd be glued together almost, right? So what is the separation we're skiing? <coughs> we're seeing. We're seeing vertical separation. We're not seeing horizontal separation here. Every World Cup skier that finishes in the top five, at some point in the turn, this knee is touching that ski boot. Go through the slides. It's proven every time. So if you separate your feet so far, that you, and it's harder to tip, and it's harder to get this leg flex. Look at the flexion on this, look at the amount of flex on this inside leg. This guy has got enough muscles to probably pick everybody up here at once doing a bench squat. But he, yet he still has the flexibility in his hips and his knees to be able to flex that leg totally out of the way. Why? He doesn't want weight on it. If that leg stiffened up and stopped flexing, he'd be on his inside foot. Okay? So Look at his upper body. Look, if you put it, if you had a zipper on a jacket, look at look at the angle of this vertical. Look at the angle of his legs. That's not leaning in. I can guarantee you that. Leaning in is like the previous slide where we saw that skier leaning in. This is counterbalance and counteracting. Okay, so this is the uh, what we call um, the upper body control or the upper body movements counteracting. And moving from foot to foot is much easier with your feet closer together than it is. If your feet are out like this, you're on your big toe edges to start with, because they're wider in your hips. So you never want your feet wider in your hips when you're skiing. Okay. And the other thing is that most people don't, aren't, what isn't explained to skiers is that if my femurs are right here, this would be a straight line down to, to show what hip ski width I would want to ski with. I ski narrower than this. Why? because that's not where my femurs start. Your femurs go up, the two bones go up, and then there's an angle where they go into the pelvis. So they're actually, my femurs end up right in here. They're actually narrower than where your legs are. And how many times have you been told, well, you need your feet shoulder width apart? I mean, how many times have you been told that? Or hip width even. Hip width is too wide. You want a functional, in, in fact, Michael von Gruningen, who is the second best GS skier in the world, Stenmark was is number one still, was asked one day by just a skier coming down the hill, said, how wide do you keep your feet when you try to, when you ski? Well, how wide do you try to keep them? Well, in his very Swiss Germanic response, he said, I just stand on the hill and I let my other leg dangle down the hill. And wherever it falls, that's how wide my, my stance is. So why are we artificially telling people to get wider? Well, I'll tell you why. Because coaches think that they can get angles like this by get, getting their kids with wider stance. They think that this is a wide stance. This is not a wide stance. You'll never get a, a, an angle like this starting out with your feet this far apart. Because as soon as you tip, which you can't do for the inside foot that wide apart anyways, you're going to be on your inside foot. You're going to be waiting your inside ski. How can you get bigger angles if you've got the blocking weight on the inside ski from allowing the hips to go closer to the ground? It doesn't happen. That's why the World Cup skiers are retracting the legs to get them out of the way so the hips can go closer to the ground so there's no resistance there. It's like the tripod on, on a camera. If I, if that, that's rigid in three ways, so the camera doesn't fall over. What they're trying to do is flex that one leg. What would happen to that camera that Jay has in there if he flexed that one leg? It would fall over, and that's that's basically the principle of how you get angles in skiing. Who is this guy, Al? 
Uh, that's Marcel Herscher. He's a uh, Austrian. Uh, you'll hear a lot about Austrians here. Not tonight, probably. Uh, he, uh, he was world junior champion when he was 18 in both slalom and chess. He then raced in World Cups that, at the end of that year. The Austrian team put him on a World Cup. He was on a podium at the finals uh, in third place as an 18-year-old. I've seen video of him skiing when he was 16 years old, and I guarantee you he could have made the th top 30 flip uh, if he started as a 16-year-old. That's how precocious uh, this guy is a skier. He's amazing to watch. It's like gymnastics on skis. It's like a cat on skis. I mean, it's just phenomenal to watch. Uh, and, and plus, he's in balance all the time. He's not fighting the hill. He, he is in balance. An amazing amount of balance. So, uh, this is the old man trying to imitate Marcel Hersher. Okay, so this is what we're looking at. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in most World Cup skiers, this hand, arm, shoulder, knee are leading in the inside. Again, we're focusing on the inside of the turn, the inside half of the body. Okay, The boot, the knee is on the boot, right? We just talked about that. It's, it, at the World Cup skiers, top skiers, high-end carving skiers, this knee will be on that boot at some point. You can see the bottoms of the skis are almost 90 degrees to the, to the slope. All right? and the shoulders are relatively level for that amount of tipping. So arcing, we're talking about arcing, carving. This is the maybe the end goal for some people. And we'll talk about how you get there and, and what the steps are. But what is going on here? Inside foot is tipping the inside ski. Inside leg is flexed. We've talked about that already. How to get angles, flex the inside leg, get out of the way, and you can tip it further. Inside foot pulled back. OK, here's another one. OK, let's go back here. Inside foot, this man, I guarantee you, if you watch video, he is the best in the world at keeping his inside foot under his body. He does it sooner, he does it earlier, and he does it more than any of the other top three guys. And the other top three guys are Pentaro, uh, Kostelich, and Slalom, we're talking about now, and Neureiter. Okay, and Neureiter comes about legitimately because his mother was a double gold medalist and a silver medalist in the Olympics. And the only, she only, the only reason she won a silver medal in the Olympics, not a gold, was because our own Kathy Kreiner beat her in the GS okay, in that Olympics. Her fa his father is a World Cup slalom champion and winner. So he comes by his abilities legitimately. Those are the three top slalom skiers, four top slalom skiers in the world right now, including her shirt. And then there's a gap after that. But the, the gap, the guys behind the gap, which is amazing to me, they're very close together. But they haven't found that link that's going to get them up to that next level. They haven't found it yet. And, and it's obvious, if you watch it. If you know what we've just gone through, and you watch photos that I have on my blog, and compare what this guy is doing to those guys, you don't have to be a coaching genius to figure out why they're not in the top four. It's right there in front of you. Very easy to spot, very easy to deal with. So, inside leg flexing, body relaxing, creating angle. Now, balance and pressure is still on the outside ski. That doesn't change. Because, because you're moving the inside foot, you're tipping the inside foot, you're flexing the inside foot, that puts all the weight on the other side. You still want that. The outside ski is still the dominant bearer of pressure and gripping edge, that's all still there. We're just moving with the inside to create that. We're still creating the same thing that we've always talked about, even back when I was a kid. Get your weight on your outside ski. But how do you do it? That's the key to it. How do you do it efficiently? How does it work? Okay, this is uh, four aft. Okay, so one of the essentials, one of our key ingredients of skiing is being four aft. Okay? Many people will tell you, and you've probably heard it, get your hips forward. Stand up taller. But if you look at it this way, it's a different way of looking at it. recognition. We talked about recognition because of, you know with the scenario where the inside skate is flat before we talked about that. Okay, recognition. If you look at it, that his feet are ahead of his hips. From that point of view, instead of looking at it like his hips are back, you've got a totally different perspective on how you move to get forward. That's what is how we look at core half balance. 
feet ahead of the hips. Okay. There's nothing wrong with having your hips lo lower than than your knee than your knees, or even with your knees. There's nothing wrong with that because if you're flexing properly, it's going to go there. So you, we should not be afraid of that lowering a little bit. We don't have to lower it to this level. Let's lower it up level. I mean, if we lower it to this angle, you know, halfway, that's plenty of flexing that, to get you from one turn to the other. Even flexing that much is plenty of flexing to get you from one turn to the other. The difference is if you are extending by this much, which is probably a quarter of an inch, which nobody knows here what that means. It's four, about four millimeters. If you extend four millimeters, as opposed to flexing four millimeters, it doesn't look like much difference. But it is diametrically opposed in your ability to change edges. It is a completely different mechanic. You will not be able to release your big toe edge to go into the new turn with tipping if you raise your center mass by four millimeters or extend your leg. However, if you flex by four millimeters, you will beautifully flow and move and connect into the new turn. Now, if you, I'll give you the, the places to look for these things, but I have a YouTube video where I'm demonstrating exactly that. I'm making just gentle turns and gentle slopes, and if you look at it, you will not see my hips go up, you will not see my hips go down. But there is a gentle amount of flexing in there that just makes the skis go back and forth like a dance. That is a minimal amount of effort. And it makes for beautiful round turns. We call that the brush car turn. And if you go on YouTube and type in Earl Harp Ski, you'll come up with all my videos and you can pick that one out and uh, study it. So here, we're back to this gentleman right here. Um, so how, okay, so his feet are ahead of his hips. So what, so what, yeah. But how does he get to here? Now look at this. This in World Cup racing, which is about 40 miles an hour, is less than a tenth of a second. He went from this to this in less than a tenth of a second. That's almost inconceivable when you watch it. When you look at it, you look at those photos, how can he be there in a tenth of a second or less? Well, that's how fast they're going. And how can he change from his ski tips being in the air to his ski tips being on the ground and his heels, both heels are off the snow? Because, and this is where the secret lies in getting your feet back behind your hips. First of all, he's, as soon as he releases here, he's just flexed this leg. That's why the ski is off the ground. Okay? It was long and he was up at this angle just prior to this. He's flexed this, and when he flexes this, the grip just goes away and his center mass goes that way. Okay, center mass being around his belly button. Okay, so he goes that way, and he's about to change edges. He's already changed edges by there. All right, now he's flexed this up, and he's going to tip this boot. Obviously, he's already tipped it over here, so you know that this leg's going to flex, and this boot is going to tip towards this little toe edge. This is on the little toe edge. This is on the big toe edge, but this one is there first. If he did it the other way around, the ski would be flat. This one would be bent inside, and his hip wouldn't be over there. That's the difference between starting your turn with flexing and tipping towards the little toy. We talked about the inside of the body creates the movement. He created the movement, the inside of the body. Okay. And as he went out of this turn, he gave his feet a tug and he pulled them back, held them underneath him. What does that do? It slows your feet down, accelerates your center mass. But he's going, his center mass is going this way, not that way. So he's actually taking a shorter line with his hips than his skis. His skis are going out and back, where his hips are going straight down the fall line, and therefore, when he comes onto the edges, his feet are behind his hips. And if you do that even slowly, it works beautifully. If you do it with small little flexing movements, it works beautifully. You don't have to ski like this. You don't have to get this low. And you don't have to get the tails of your skis in the air to be able to do it. This is just an example of how the best skiers in the world are doing it. Okay. So that's your four aft. This is my favorite part because you get to shoot some slides in here. This only took me six hours to figure this out. Then when I put it together. So 
Here the skis are headed where these arrows are. The fall line or the, the slope is downhill that way. This is the transition, the flexing part. Okay? And you can see the skis are headed that way, but my zipper on my jacket is facing straight down the hill. Okay? This also is a reference point. I use the zipper and I use this outside little toe edge to keep my body aligned to that foot. All right? And what that does for me is I keep it aligned to that outside foot. My, sh my zipper is facing towards you. And so when I finish the turn, I hold that. And I hold it until my, ski my knees flex and my skis come to the new edges. Okay, now you can see the skis are on edge. The, the angle of the skis is a little bit more uh, down the hill. And uh, my upper body is still facing in that direction. Inside leg is beginning to flex. Shol hands and shoulders are level. And I'm in balance. Okay, so there's the balance point. Never disrupt balance. Always increase your balance. Okay, so here's the next slide. And you can see, again, the skis have created more of a direction change. The inside leg is more flexed. The outside leg is longer. And guess how I got that long? By flexing this. So my center mass moved in. I didn't push it there. Guarantee you. This is me. I know what I'm doing when I ski. I know what my movements are. Okay? I did not push that leg. I, I relaxed to get there. I did not push to get there. Okay? And my upper body is still level. Okay? My zipper now is facing towards my skis because the more I come around, my body's going to start turning that way because I want, this is the unwinding that we talked about earlier, the lower body's unwinding, and so I'm getting the turning part for free. I'm just getting the tipping so the skis and the side cut are going to do more work for me. Okay, I want them, you know, after all, those skis are like 850 bucks, okay? If you don't put them on edge, you're only skiing on 50 bucks worth. <laughs> Seriously, the engineering of the ski is the side cut and the stuff that bends. That, that's what's costing you the $850. If I don't do that, I'm skiing on 50 every, Everybody can put a bottom on a pair of skis. You know what that costs the ski company? It's 50 bucks. That's what you're skiing on unless you put them on edge. So you don't want to be wasting all that money just because, you know, that's not part of the ski that really works. So the counterbalance part is the zipper more vertical than the angle of the legs. You can see the you can see the arrows right here. This one's still going out that way. Now that's going more down the hill, or the skis come around a little more. But the body has not changed much except for the angles. Right? The body hasn't turned much. The body hasn't gone arm up further, bound further, uh, trying to rebalance. It's in balance. So you don't really change that much when you're in the turn. It's just a matter of creating bigger angles by flexing and relaxing. Tipping the inside leg. Flexing the inside leg. And holding the counterbalance. So that if, if, this, if this were not more level, and this body came inside here like this, I'd have weight on that, so I couldn't create those angles. I've got very little weight on my inside ski. Here you can see actually there's no snow flying. Here's there's a little bit of snow flying off of it because it's still on the snow, but it's much lighter than the outside ski. Here's another transition I'm going to show you. And remember what we saw earlier in the, the skiers, this hand leads, this shoulder leads, this hip leads. Okay, that's called counteracting of the upper body. <coughs> little bit less angle now because I'm starting to come out of the turn. The skis have turned far enough. And what happens then is the knees bend more. And as soon as I start releasing, because this leg is longer, this one's a little shorter, but this one's coming also shorter. Now they're both shorter. And the ideal situation is in transition, you want to have the same amount of flex on both legs. And the ski is flat to the surface. Okay, we're going to get there. And that creates the balanced transition. Now, right now, this is my free foot, this is my weighted foot. Now when I come through here, both skis are lighter because I've flexed, and then I'm going to create a new free foot, which is lighter, and I'm going to create a new stance foot, which is going to be the heavier side. So here's the complete flexion, still sort of on the old edges, like for that previous turn. The edges are slightly tilted that way. 
You can kind of see under the base, not very, very much. The angle is very small. But still, it has, the skis have not come flat yet. Now they've gone a little bit beyond flat. Okay, now they're, you can, can't see the bottoms, but you can start to see how the tops are starting to tip towards us. You can see the change in the knee angle. Okay, so the knee, this knee is getting lighter as I'm flexing it, and I'm going to have it tip first into the new turn. To create the transition. And that's the transition phase. Here, from this side to this side, you've just gone through the transition. And your balance, you're over your skis, and you're tipping your inside foot, and you're lightening the, the, the pressure on the inside. You notice this one's already more bent than that one? And this one's already long. I didn't push it long. It got there because what? How do you get a long leg on the outside, which is very preferential for skiing? The long leg on the outside happened because there's my belly button. If I didn't get a long leg, they'd both be flexed the same. My belly button would still be over here, like here. See, that belly button goes straight between the skis. It's almost straight between the skis. Now look at where it is now. If I draw a straight line, it's inside the skis, right? So. That was created by this flexing and this relaxing to drop to the inside of the turn. And that's called tipping to the little toe edge and lightening and flexing that leg. So, different movements create different results. We see skiers loving this because it works. Releasing by flexing we talked about. Releasing the downhill or old stance ski or old outside ski. Creating angles by relaxing and flexing the inside leg to create bigger angles. Tipping of the lower body is key to the whole thing. Counter tipping is the upper body going the other way so you don't lean in, so you, you don't put pressure in the wrong place. And counterbalance is the same thing, so with the hips and torso, that's above your center of mass and your hips. And 4F balance is held or gained back by the pulling back of the inside foot as your hips take a shorter line and your skis take a little longer line so your hips get ahead of your feet or your feet get behind your hips. Okay, good coaching works. One thing you'll notice about Austrian skiers, the men and the women, okay, it doesn't matter. There's a system that they have in place. It works. Clearly, if you go over the history of the last 20 years, who won the Nations Cup the most in World Cup skiing? The Austrians, without a doubt. It's overwhelming. So what, what are we seeing here? What have we just talked about? We've talked about flexing the inside leg. This is Anna Fenninger, world champion, World Cup winner. Beautiful skier, absolutely gorgeous skier. What is she leading with? Here, here, here. Flexed inside leg, long outside leg. If, if I was a spectator on the side of the hill, I could read her number. Why? Because her upper body is counteracted. Her hips are counteracted. Okay. So this old guy up here, if I was standing on the side, I could see a zipper facing to the outside of the hill. Leading with the inside hand, leading with the inside shoulder, tipped and flexed with the inside <coughs> ski. Both skis are at the same angle. Okay. How do you think that this skier is going to get out of this turn? Guesses, hands up, guess. Come on, somebody guess. Flex and relax that leg, exactly. It's very simple. If you have a long leg, it's the easy. It's, it's hard when they're both flexed the same amount and, and you don't have a long, short leg. This is simple to get out of this turn. All you gotta do is bend this, get the pressure off of here, or even retract it, and this body is coming over to the other side by itself for free. You don't have to push it there. This is a... 11-year-old skier that I've been working with. I have about six skiers that I work with from California. I started with them when they were six years old. This is an 11-year-old. The, he, the slope is here, right, the fall line. He's upside down on the slope. He's not going to fall over. Because, look at his zipper. Look at his leg angles. Look at the tipping of the inside foot. This leg is flexed more. His hands are level. His shoulders are level. He's in complete balance. That's called being upside down to the slope. And that's not going to change very much, except he's going to flex that inside leg more, and his hips is going to go closer to the ground through the rest of that arm. And then he's going to have a long leg, short leg, just like the other photo, and he's going to flex that leg, do the same thing in the other direction. 
So once you see the rhythm developing and how you go from side to side, it's not complicated. It's not complicated at all. If skiing should not be complicated. It's maybe unnatural. I'm not going to say skiing is natural. You're going to get natural, uh, be a natural skier that it's easy. It's not easy and it's not natural. But the movements are known to make skiing successful. You just have to implement the right movements. That's, that's all it is. That, that's all it takes. This is a seven-year-old. Relative age stays the same, but he's about four years behind the other kid. Okay. He, this <coughs> seven and eight-year-olds with proper coaching should be skiing with World Cup technique. There's absolutely no reason why seven and eight-year-old skiers should not be skiing with World Cup technique. And if they're not, they're not being coached. Simple as that. <coughs> This, this, this young man right here basically had not even formal PMTS coaching. He was skiing with another group. He came along with his older sister and watched and got to run some gates and here and there got a small bit of the information the rest of the kids were getting. And within four days, he was skiing like that. <coughs> but the movements were the movements that create that kind of ski. There are a lot of movements that don't create that kind of ski and interfere with that kind of scheme. So as the theme goes, we should be able to use these movements in all conditions. And here's some examples. There's powder skiing. This is on a 66 millimeter ski. I know because I still own it. This is on fat skis. Okay. Normally, to ski that wide, I would have a rope and a motor in front of me <laughs> to do what, what, what you can do with these skis. But in powder, they're, they float. They're, they're, they come up easy when you flex. They even work better with the technique we're talking about. It's very easy to ski powder with this technique to go from one side to the other. And this is one of the other four of top slalom skiers in the world. This happens to be a giant slalom, but he's also a very good giant slalom skier. And the two guys that are top skiers in the world right now also ski GS pretty well uh, in two events. I mean top skier in two events. Hersher is a top skier in both events and so is this gentleman. This is, this is Pent Alexis Pentero from France. And look at that picture. So World Cup skier just about ready to make the turn around this break gate. So he's almost in transition, not quite there yet. Inside leg flex. Outside leg also flex because he's already started his release, so he's not really in the loaded phase of the turn. His upper body is vertical, his hands are level, his shoulders are level, everything is there, everything is balanced, everything is where it should be. And so these guys are doing it right, and, and they're great examples uh, for even, we can apply this to all skiers. As I say, it's just the speed, the energy, the amplitude the dynamics of the edge angles, and, and the rest of it you can do. And that concludes our demonstration of what we're doing on skis to get skiers to ski with World Cup technique, with relaxation, with ease of turning in all conditions. So thank you for coming. Wow. Uh, yes, we'd love to feel questions. I have one very good question. Yes, sir. First of all, as far as I've looked at a lot your books, first of all, I've looked at George Hubert's stuff and uh, many of the other uh, writers like Warren Witherall, and they all have a lot of similar information, different approaches towards the teaching methodology. But one question that comes to mind time and time again is how to get counter, how to get counter and how to get hip angles. And um, I was taught some time ago, this was part of the Canadian philosophy, is okay, get up there and you feel the pinch in your hips, feel the pinch. So I got all screwed up with that, trying to feel the pinch, it stiffened my skin, etc, etc. Yep. Eventually I came to the conclusion that the uh, what is conceived as a big edge angle and a big hip angle, big angulation, and if you look very carefully at some of your photos from the correct angle that is face on the skis, is nothing more than, say, Mr. Hersher, with a little bit of counter and a lot of upper body forward lean. And then the need for pinching or any special movements to get this 
a parent angle at an x disappears. So what do you think about you know, any kind of muscular movements in the hip area in order to get angulation or lack there? Okay, well... What's, what's your opinion on that? Well, on that uh, that's a really vital I, I don't operate much on opinion, first of all. Yeah. I but operate on science. Back. And, science. And, and the muscles that create those movements Right? In, in, in your pelvis to turn your femurs, basically, yep. are connected to your pelvis and the top of your femurs. They are the piriformis, the gemellus major and minor muscles, are the turners of the femur, external rotators of the femur. Okay, so if I am going to create this movement, the, those muscles have to be active. Now, in some people, those muscles are not even active. They, they're not, they're, they may be out of touch with movement, because those muscles are deep underneath the glutes. Okay, glute medius and glute maximus. So they're actually sub the major muscles that you can see, you know, the butt muscles, if we want to really say it. So those muscles are not very strong to start with. So if we have tension in our mid-bodies, those muscles aren't really being activated. That's why it's hard to get count for many people, to get counteracting, first of all, even a little bit of it. Yeah. Now, as I said before with flexing, with bending, if you bend this much, or if you extend this much, it's a completely bio different biomechanical way of skiing. It changes the complete approach of skiing, and the same goes for counteracting. If you know how to counteract and create the movement in the right direction, you don't need it big. You only need to be able to create enough of it so you don't undo it. And that's the key to the success. Now, what you're saying about the upper body, you'll only see that at the very end, when just prior to release. It won't be through the curve. And what they do is, as they come closer to the end of the turn, they're actually strengthening the counteracting to hold it. Because the forces want to unwind that, because the skis are making a very violent, sharp turn at that level. So what they're doing with the upper body is then trying to hold the counteracting so they can retract the legs under that cavity. It's hard to retract the legs if you're this way and, or leaning the opposite direction. But so, how do you create the counteracting? This is my question. Well, you have where's, to, where's the muscle power? Or well, it doesn't you, require do you do a lot of muscle power yeah. if you're not if you're unhinging. You know, that, that's the thing is people at the beginning of the turn don't create it early enough, and then once the once the rotation starts, it's almost impossible to stop it and reverse it. That's right. That's the hard part. If you start a little bit at the beginning of your turn and start the counteracting. Uh, Enough so that it doesn't move forward. Then you're in charge of what's happening. You're, you're able to control it. Now, what you see though, you know, and, and I'm just presuming this, that you may have run into this situation, is you focus so much on your hips to get this counteracting that you're looking at or trying to create that the tipping wasn't there anymore. And the foundation for this movement is tipping first and relaxation. And if you're trying to get the hip back and the hip in create angles, you, that's what's going to destroy uh, What undoes a lot of this? We were out <coughs> skiing with some people in the organization today, and the, the finish of the turn was being deconstructed by the way they used their pole plant. So now look at it for a second and analyze your friends and your own skiing when you're going skiing out there. If I'm like this, okay, and I'm at the end of my turn, this hand is here, we saw a lot of photos with this hand out in front, as I pointed out, leading, leading, leading. This hand is, is normal, and then I finish the turn like this, and I bend, like you said, a little bit flexing. I don't need to swing this pole, I can tap it right there. That's what the World yeah. Cup guys are doing. It's a pole tap, yeah. Yeah, tap. It's a yeah. tap, and it's after they knock the pole over, and it's a very light tap. Now, what you see on the hill, though, is this. The swing of the pole goes to the ski tip, which drags the shoulder towards the ski tip. And where am I facing them? I've unwound what I've just created. Now I can't use it. It's all done. You've, uh, you've already unwound yourself by the movement you've created. And very few people are, re are uh, cognizant of that. And you see it all over the place. So that is a key part of why people don't hold their counter right there. You've got to hold your counter to the very end. Yes. Uh, I, I can see how all of this applies to uh, people who are level 3, 4, and up. Uh, I don't see how... Within ski school level 3? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We have levels 1 and 6. Okay, yep. Yeah. But I don't see how I can take a beginner adult, okay. not a child, but a beginner right. adult, yep. 
yeah. directly into this. Into parallels. Yeah. Okay. Because they're yeah. terrified. Yeah. And we, we teach them on a on a slope of about yeah. I don't know five degrees or something really right. really really small yeah. and they're terrified. Right. So how would we get them to pay any attention to any of that? Well, first of all, um, when we teach direct parallel, we don't teach it on any slope at all. Again. But even before you put them on snow, we go through the movements and the groups. So they have a sense of the movements and balance. And when you teach it on snow and skis on, you're teaching balance with each step. Okay. The, the former methods of wedge and so on are trying to brace you against where the gravity is taking you. And what we're teaching is immediate balance with movements towards a little wedge, just as, as we talked about here, and flexing, and rebalance, flexing and rebalancing. And what happens with the modern skis when you do that on a slight, even the minuscule slope, I mean, even a few degrees is fine. The skis, as soon as they start stepping, they get kind of comfortable to step, the skis start scooching around and creating two skis that make turns. There are a few people in this room who have taught beginners straight from the bottom up, and they can attest to exactly what happens. And as soon as they can do that in both directions, the fear isn't there the way it is when you're fighting gravity. You're actually confident with the steps will bring you up against the hill and finish the, finish the turn with stepping, and you're being active with balancing movements. So right away, you're already learning to balance, whereas this isn't balance. This is like maybe stability, but it's also bracing, making you very stiff. So no, there have been thousands and thousands of lessons taught during parallel this way. And it would it would take a training session. Where's Wendell? He ran out now. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah. No, it would take a training session for a no, it, it is in progress. Many there are skiers in the United States right now using this. And and uh, and, but it's a good question because I hear it a lot. I hear, at our area we can't do this. And, and it's not the first time that's, that's come up. Because, and then we go to their area and we show them where they can do it and we can show, show you how it works. Uh, there are many places that are flat enough that was, uh, I guarantee you. Can do it. Just a question in regard to polls again. Watching the, the uh, slides there, there didn't seem to be any really poll action that's right. from, uh, in your turns. That's right. That, that's, that's right. That's, we call it the no swing poll okay. tap. Um, and and swing. one of the first things we do at our camps, um, you know, discussing this with some people from the ski school today, um, we, we show them how skiers skiing by are using their poles un to undo their technique, basically. And, and you know, pole t planting is a timing mechanism. And we as humans, we're very focused on timing with, with movements. So a pole <coughs> tap or pole plant, as we used to call it, is a timing mechanism. And guess what it does? It triggers your old movements over and over again. So if you want to, if you want to learn new movements, get rid of your pole plant. And, and when we start out, we tell people not to pole plant, because we're trying to teach them new movements, and as soon as they pole plant, they go right back to the old movements. It's wired very deep in your brain, the pole plant. So what we teach is a no-swing pole plant. So and basically, we don't even have to teach it because when you get the counter correctly and you hold the inside hand ahead, leading the shoulder and the hip on this side, guess what? You've just taken the, the, the arm on the lower side, which is normally the pole stabbing uh, arm or hand. It places it in exactly the spot without having to swing the arm in any way. And you just tap it down on the ground and that's enough. That, that's enough. And that's what the World Cup skiers are doing. And, uh, if you need to tap it harder in the bumps, you just put it in a little more solidly uh, for bump skiing, and it's still there. And the beauty of it is, it keeps your upper body facing your outside ski boot, and it keeps it open. See, there's no obstruction in front of you. So, and then you can flex it, on, the legs can unwind underneath you when you do it that way. Whereas when you do this, and you plant out in front, now you've got your arm in front of you where you, where you want to be going, Right? And you've just unwound that tension in your body that's going to make the skis go downhill for you. So you really hurt your own beginning of your next turn by doing that. So that's why we eliminate the pole plan. And that's why you don't see much of it out there. Uh, oh, I was going to give you where to find more information. Well, first of all, I have a blog, which is a, it's a technical blog. Uh, it's a, a lot of World Cup uh, skiing explained and uh, how to use it for your regular skiing purposes. 
Um, and all of these movements are explained in more detail, written down if you're into reading uh, and study, that's a good place to go. We have numerous <coughs> videos, that, uh, indoor practice videos on our website or on YouTube. YouTube, I have over 35 instructional videos. Uh, this is all free information. Uh, it's Everything we do is accessible by the public. Um, not so often seen by other instruction methods. They like to keep it kind of uh, in their books for their ski instructors, and the public has a little bit more difficulty accessing the, what they're actually going to learn. We open it, the, the doors and open the books, and it, you can see exactly what we're doing. Uh, you can learn from the books and the videos of, uh, that we have available, um, and uh, there are all levels there, uh, and, and hundreds of ways to practice. Indoor practice, outdoor practice, uh, and dynamic indoor, not just standing around, but actually moving, tipping, doing the changes, learning how to balance indoors so you can apply it to outdoors. So that's uh, YouTube, Harold Harp Ski. Uh, or just go to Google and Google my name and all of that stuff will come up and you can click on anything you want and go research it, go find it, uh, investigate it. Um, it's all there. Before we leave, we have Jerry Cotter right here, uh, and our, as I found out, our eldest instructor on, this, on the uh, uh, senior ski team. And he is over the big 8-0. Wow. Eight <laughs> And, and we, wanted, we wanted to make a special presentation, and I forgot the book, so I'm going to take full, full blame for that. So, but and I wanted Harold to present the instructor's manual to you, so we well, have it, and you're, we've got it. What a thrill. Thank so. you. It's hard to just see a better example. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you still got a ways to go. My dad is 92. Going to Austria this year to go ski. So, oh, so there's still yeah. many more years of skiing ahead of you, so just you know keep, well, keep thank going. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. By the way, I take you up to bed with me at night. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have a that's what I need to know. I've ruined a few marriages here. <laughs>